I don't know how beautiful this will be. I'm going to try to discuss some history, some logic, some art, some philosophy. It may be too much for 30 minutes, but we'll see. Thank you. OK. Uh, so uh, my short answer to that is sometimes yes, but um, not generally. <laughs> OK, uh, philosophy and, and maybe art and mathematics, too, often begin when we don't quite know what to say. When we're in a space where the concepts of our question aren't yet clear, and we feel we need to find a notation, maybe a formulation, look at things under a new aspect. Sometimes what we do is to dissolve the question as a question that is important to us. All that may require simplification or reduction. The elimination of what is haphazard is not always itself haphazard. That's very important. So I think what matters to the notion of simplicity that I'm going to be unfolding today is that it's designed, and it works because there's a point to it. Uh, we design simplicity in part to adjust means to ends, expressive means to ends in particular, in subjects like logic and in philosophy. So notions like suitability, rightness, not so much notions like truth or utility are important or correctness, even though sometimes, as Amy Sandback said yesterday, the aha feeling is there for us. So uh, the simple does reveal itself. We try to eliminate the arcane or the inessential in favor of the direct, partly because we want knowledge to be communicable. We want people to be able to take it in. And we don't want to always be asking more and more about our primitive notions, why choose that one? It has to end somewhere. So I think of the notions of simplicity and rigor, uh, particularly in the subjects I think about, as very tight cousins. Neither is reducible to the other, but each partakes of the other. And the notion of rigor is a bit of a stepchild, I think, in, in philosophy. People don't investigate that notion enough. They act as if it's all clear and we know what it means. But I think in philosophy, in particular, it, it, it's not at all clear what it means. And that notion has a very important history in the early part of the 20th century, when different philosophers from very different emerging traditions began to call on the notion of rigor to define what they were doing. Now, simplicity like rigor is not everything. That's important. Uh, but it is something. It's something worth achieving when we can. And it's also worth knowing when simplicity cannot be uh, attained, when simplification is not a relevant demand in a certain dimension. And I think it's very important what Professor Gromov said yesterday. False simplicity is quite common. It's easy to see that simple grammar can mask vast complexity. The Goldbach conjecture is very easy to state, but it's very difficult to understand really what it means. The Fermat conjecture was well known because it resisted methods of proof for a very long time. What matters there is the journey, not so much the destination. The journey with the Fermat is that it created lots of other mathematics. But the statement itself of the theorem is more or less void of interesting consequences. So I think what it took to resolve things is what matters. It's the journey with simplicity that matters, not in a way the destination. So this business of the, ah, oh, yes, oh, it has to be like that. That's very important. Not knowing what further to say is a mark, and perhaps a crucial one, of the simple. But to repeat, it's a mistake to think the aha feeling, or the ah, yes, always tracks correctness or truth, particularly if you say it does so via a notion of intuition. I think this is very problematic philosophically. Um, despite the, the, the beauty of Etienne's talk yesterday. In philosophy, that is a notion that's problematic and should be. Anyway, the simple shows itself forth anyway, regardless of what we say or chatter or interpret about it. It really shines through. That's part of the mark of it. And I think part of the philosopher's job, maybe the artist's job, maybe the mathematician's job as well, is to watch out for false simplifications. Uh, the job of separating the extraneous uh, chatter from the core of the thing, there really is an art to that. And uh, it's all too easy to fall into language of the kind that it has to be like this, it must be, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so examples. 
Here's a quote from Wittgenstein that will sort of bookend my talk. It's a rather well-known one. He asked in the early 30s, why is philosophy so complicated? It ought, after all, to be completely simple. Philo answer is, philosophy unties the knots in our thinking, which we have tangled up in an absurd way. But to do that, it must make movements which are just as complicated as the knots. Although the result of philosophy is simple, its methods for arriving there cannot be so, the complexity of philosophy is not in its matter, but in our tangled understanding. So the idea is that when you unravel a knot, you're not left with, you know, something at the end. It's gone. He came to think that this was a very poor analogy for mathematics. Because, of course, even if you unwind and unknot things in a mathematical context, you do have a result at the end. So he rejected this for that. But the idea of philosophy is an activity of clarification. I think this unknotting idea is uh, very central to what he was doing. So how did he apply it? <clears throat> he applied it, for example, to uh, writings of G.H. Hardy. So I'll put this uh, picture into a bit of context. In the book Mathematician's Apology of 1940, uh, the great number theorist Hardy famously insisted that the aim of a mathematician's life is aesthetic, the values of beauty, clarity, unexpectedness, and depth being paramount. Now, of course, Hardy is not wrong that terms are frequently used in everyday contexts in mathematics that are often used in aesthetic contexts as well. Terms like surprising, striking, deep, interesting, beautiful, vivid, they're crucial terms of art. They're quite ordinary terms of art. They're quite ubiquitous terms of art uh, within the practice of mathematics. And mathematicians do have a striking ability to appreciate and articulate and show what makes a result or a problem or a theory deep or interesting or significant. However, Hardy's view is quite hopeless as a philosophy of mathematics. It gets mathematics wrong, it gets his life wrong, and it gets aesthetics wrong if he says the purpose of mathematics is the aha feeling. Wittgenstein thought Hardy's apology a miserable book, one that might at best provide a philosopher with what Wittgenstein called raw material to scrutinize and investigate. For Wittgenstein, Hardy's view could not achieve what Hardy hoped it could, namely a resonant and realistic sense of pure mathematics as a human and autonomous enterprise, a pursuit with its own standards of clarity, suitability, value, and correctness, something more than a merely empty formalism or a game like chess, and something different than a branch of engineering, physics, or psychology. Hardy risked reducing the value of mathematics to an inarticulate feeling, and he risked reducing aesthetics to that as well. Now, Wittgenstein's comments here that I've put up here are on a textbook of Hardy's, uh, the 1941 edition of A Course in Pure Mathematics. This was a widely used textbook. And um, <clears throat> this is very odd, these kind of midrashic commentaries around the edges of Hardy's presentation of particular theorems. Here is the irrationality of the square root of two. And the first question would be, why on earth is Wittgenstein doing this? He copied these midrashic uh, comments down into, later into manuscript books and started working with them. So again, he's treating Hardy as raw material. Perhaps this is a kind of criticism akin to judge, judgments of taste or presentation. Wittgenstein objects at various points to Hardy's particular way of writing a textbook. Now, one of the main themes of Wittgenstein's criticisms it seems to me here in these pages, and there are roughly 20 pages or so, or 25 on which he wrote comments. One of the main themes of those criticisms is how difficult it is to communicate the integrity of a mathematical object or proof, to see it as it is, plain and simple and un unadulterated. That, to Wittgenstein, is true as opposed to false rigor. It requires careful situating of the object at just the right crossroads, of proofs and applications and structures, finding just the right motifs to crisply and directly communicate the result. As Etienne said yesterday in going through that wonderful textbook passage, that's what you're looking for, is just the right dense motif. Now, in uh, the, the case of these remarks on Hardy, uh, one of the major focuses is Hardy's presentation of Dedekind's analysis of the real line in terms of cuts. 
<clears throat> now, Wittgenstein, I think, was much too critical of Dedekind's analysis of the line and many of his remarks. But nevertheless, I think there is something lying behind what he's saying that has to do with simplicity in a reasonable way. Even if Dedekind's analysis of continuity of the line is correct, it may mislead people. Philosophers may insist and have insisted and continue to insist, for example, that it's too naive any longer to take an individual real number like e or pi or a decimal expansion as it is, as an ordinary everyday object, not needing analysis. The idea might be, for example, that we have to talk about structures or decide on our ontology in order to make those individual numbers intelligible. Yet even Dedekind himself, and also Contour, still wanted to remain within the orbit of the plane. Dedekind insists that his own demands for intelligibility require sensitivity as a constraint to what he would later call the naive point of view. This, applied to the most basic level in mathematics, would turn out to be the natural numbers themselves taken as natural. As he said, we think continuity into the line, forming or framing what is now known as the contour Dedekind axiom. It's a kind of church's thesis for the line. Dedekind refused to say that his analysis of cuts told us what space really is. Why? Because the rigor of his project was to try to unfold the laws of number independently of any theory of space, particularly a Kantian theory of space, but to allow the numbers to be as they were independently of any such philosophical account. Then, the basic idea of rigor, or of simplicity here, is this. A novel fundamental system of conceptualization should ideally require no technical knowledge beyond what Dedekind frequently calls common sense when it comes to the basis. It should as much as possible recover and not displace our naive numbers, uh, naive ideas about numbers, but exhibit these as part of the purely intellectual structure of human thought. That, of course, is the desire of logicism, and, and Dedekind lies in that tradition. But modernist mathematician that he was, Dedekind would seek to systematize the theory of natural numbers in a wider setting. He would incorporate actually infinite objects into mathematics. But as I want to stress, he would still demand that within his analysis, both the continuum and even the natural numbers be allowed to reappear at the end of the systematization as, and I quote, faithful and familiar friends through the use of commonplace thinking or quote, good common sense. That is to say, by means of thought not dependent upon, I again quote, technical or mathematical or philosophical knowledge in the least degree. So here we have a notion of simplification designed to eliminate philosophical speculation, to eliminate uh, tendentiousness. And to speak more generally about modernism, and this is something I learned from Stanley Cavell a very long time ago, I think it's a mistake to see modernism as, in some sense, an abstraction or a dematerialization or as somehow attached to form alone. Instead, we could see modernism as a way of allowing form that's going to show through anyway to show itself forth in our everyday lives and practices. And this is a kind of constraint or rigor on modernism that I see in Dedekind that I think Wittgenstein himself also embraced. So one element of what simplicity contributes to the idea of rigor is then a drive to recover an everyday sense of the plane, of what we do, something we can take for granted in the face of abstraction and machinery that introduces uh, needless or perhaps necessary or anyway optional elements of complexity into the picture. In this way, simplicity like rigor may contribute to making grasp of the truth less haphazard and communicable, but the relation to truth is indirect, as is the relation to knowledge, if knowledge is conceived of in terms of true statements alone. So a simplification is not a brute intuition of the truth, but a move in a problem space, in a process of coming to see things as they are. Now, another example, well known to everyone in this room, I'm sure, is the Sheffer stroke. 
1913, Schaeffer, who was a student of Josiah Royce's and William James and Bertrand Russell, was uh, interested in investigating what he termed Boolean algebras, that's Schaeffer's term. Uh, logic was conceived in the tradition from which he came as the study of all possible orderings. In the context of unearthing certain axiomatizations of Boolean algebra, he figured out that he could take care of a certain kind of philosophical problem with which Russell and C.I. Lewis and others had been struggling, namely, what is the meaning of the basic logical constants or logical primitives in Principia Mathematica? What Schaeffer saw was earlier seen by Peirce. It can be set as a very trivial exercise for any student nowadays. It's not really hard, but it's really important. Why? Because it shows not only that you can get away with just one primitive uh, connective, either neither P nor Q nor not P and Q, but if you can get away with just one connective, actually you can get away with no connectives because you could just use punctuation marks. So therefore, the problem with which Josiah Royce and C.I. Lewis and Bertrand Russell had been struggling, what is the meaning of the logical constants, that's not a problem anymore because we see that those logical constants are not referring terms. They're more like punctuation marks, which is exactly what Wittgenstein says in the Tractatus being influenced by Schaeffer's treatment of the Schaeffer stroke. And in 1927, Russell, who was a bit of a partisan for poor Schaeffer, I think he felt sorry for Schaeffer, who was having a lot of trouble here. Nevertheless, what he says is, the most definite improvement resulting from work in mathematical logic during the past 14 years is Schaeffer's stroke. People have often laughed at that and said it's silly, but Russell's not saying that it's the most important work in mathematical logic, he's saying it's the most definite improvement. Why? Because it untangled a knot in our understanding. And now C.I. Lewis doesn't have to be answered in a certain kind of way. This is a picture of some recently discovered uh, notes of Russell's 1910 lectures at Principia Mathema uh, 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 just before Principia Mathematica came out at Cambridge. Sheffer took down what turned out to be the only extant notes of those lectures. So this is very interesting. We can now see how Russell presented the Principia to Sheffer, to Wittgenstein the following fall. What's extremely interesting, and Bernie Linsky and Jim Levine will be publishing these lectures if they can figure out how to transcribe them. Unfortunately, Sheffer wrote in his own form of uh, shorthand. So it's very difficult, not simple to read. Uh, nevertheless, what's interesting is Russell does not teach his students how to read Principia. He does not use formulas in Principia at all in these lectures. He gives the students a very big picture. So it's interesting that he doesn't get involved in the fussiness of actually teaching them how to read those symbols. Okay, so that's an example of a simplification. <coughs> Another simplification is Turing's. Arguably, Hilbert's idea of rigor as a finitistic step-by-step -step logical element in proof has a kind of reductionist aim in mind, bringing us face-to-face -face with the simplest logical steps. Nevertheless, Hilbert was quite explicit that rigor is not the same as simplicity, nor is it the enemy of simplicity. Pursuit of Hilbertian rigor in proof theory requires two ideas to be, be made salient. One, after Brouwer and Gödel, there's the need for admitting that correctness is not truth, as was said yesterday. That we have some form of residue at the basis when we set up our logical proof system. And if you're Brouwer, you might set it up one way. If you're a classical logician about law of the excluded middle, you might set it up another way. So simplicity, rigor, requires admitting that some residue remains. But second, there remained the idea of making the very idea of a formal logical system plain. In order to make it plain to analyze the general notion of a formal system, you couldn't just write another formal system down. You had to do something else, and that's what Turing did. Taken in the context of Hilbert's decision problem, Turing's analysis of the idea of a step in a formal system was in terms of a very picturesque idea. And it's the picturesqueness and simplicity of that idea that I think made Turing's analysis so widely accepted. It answered beautifully, vividly, and most simply to that question, what is a formal system? But not in a reductionist way, as cognitive scientists and philosophers of mind like to think. 
Instead, he makes the notion of a formal system plain and simple to view. He compares the idea with the idea of a human being. He makes it intuitive. He makes it simple. Turing's analysis is, of course, mathematical. A Turing machine is, of course, a set of equations. It can be viewed as another formal system. But the idea, the simplification, cannot be. It's something else, and it has to do with simplicity. Turing's analysis is self-standing, accessible. It's not prejudiced with respect to any particular foundational view in philosophy of mathematics or any specific syntax. And for that reason, it's universal, or at least as ubiquitous in its applications, perhaps as even Stephen Wolfram suggested yesterday. So a Turing machine, from this point of view, is a kind of language game, a simplified snapshot of a portion of human linguistic behavior designed for a very specific pur purpose. It doesn't answer certain questions. It's not meant to. In fact, it's designed not to be a description. Gödel wrote that he found Turing's analysis, quote, unquestionably correct. But if I'm right, nothing is unquestionably correct. It is just that there are certain things that are simple, that are plain to view. OK, <clears throat> so I want to press the problem with Hardy a little bit further. I'm sure I'm running out of time. Here are my four questions. And I'll base the rest of the talk on these. Oh, dear, am I out of time, Julia? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Oh, my god. OK. <sighs> All right. Um, OK. The word aesthetic, as Rachel pointed out yesterday, since the 18th century, has to do with sensation and the form of that. So it's not really clear that it makes any sense at all to apply the notion of aesthetic to an abstract object like a number. And I wanted to just support what Rachel was saying by pointing out that already Kant insisted that explicitly math mathematical objects and proofs could not have truly aesthetic value. In his early philosophy, when he was a Leibnizian, he thought this made sense. But in his later aesthetic theory, he denied it explicitly. His sharp distinction between objective and subject impression of form allowed him not only to deny that there could be beautiful proofs or that there could be a science of the beautiful, but also to re ridicule as absurd the idea that there could be such a thing as beautiful science or fine science. If we were to try to make beautiful science, he says, nothing but pretty phrases and hot air would follow. So he claimed there could be no truly artistic genius in science. Now, although Kant denied that uh, teleological causal reasoning is used in mathematics, he did allow that there could be such a thing as the purposiveness, the formal purposiveness of a proof. And his notion of purposiveness without purpose, of apparent matching of means to end without some kind of overarching intention, was also crucial here. So this is the side of Kant that I think did have an impact on Dedekind, and of course later on other theorists of modernism, Clement Greenberg being a, a major example. Okay, um, another point, an obvious point, is truth can be ugly, messy, um, <laughs> um, trivial truth is still truth. Pro plausible reasoning is not proof. Proofs of even ugly and calculative nature are still proofs. So these are not notions that are necessary. Notions are certainly sufficient for gaining truth. Nevertheless, judgments of simplicity and rigor, my bottom line is, are not merely subjective or psychological or intuitive or stipulative. Not if we take into account the point of a simplification in a particular context. So in closing, I want to just um, take a look at two artists uh, who worked in New York and other places whose work resonates with, I think, what I've just said about Wittgenstein and simplicity. First is Mel Bochner. This is a picture of Mel Bochner in 1966. Uh, in 1966, he put together at Cooper Union what is widely regarded as the first display of conceptual art. Um, he was at that time an instructor, and he was asked to assemble a Christmas show of drawings. So he went out and collected Xerox copies of work by people he knew and liked, Donald Judge, Dan Flavin, Saul LeWitt, Eva Hesse, and others, even including some proof notes of the, the mathematician Ararat, Ararat Babakinian. He then presented these to the gallery director, and she refused to pay to frame and mount them. So he went to the art history Xerox machine, to which he had unlimited access as an instructor, 
and he put on an, an exhibition consisting of four notebooks, including working drawings, pages from Scientific American, and these Xerox copies. In 1966, there was no precedent for presenting photocopies within a gallery setting or for putting something like this on. And the trajectory of conceptual art thus became bound up quite explicitly in the work of Bauchner and the artists around him with the attempt to open thought up, to make it visible, possibly to dematerialize art, although both Bauchner and Sandbach, the artist I'll discuss in a second, uh, resist that idea of dematerialization. But to overcome the idea of a work of art as a specialized object, to reject a fetishization of the idea of an artist's genius of skill or mastery, and to open up the context of the gallery itself or the space in which art is viewed. The show was taken to reject the boundaries between art and viewer, material and conceptual, gallery space and magazine page, everyday object and artwork. So its rigor, if you like, lay in pressing beyond these traditional assumptions about how art has to be or how a gallery has to be. Now, I don't disagree with hesitations about conceptual art that were expressed by critics like Michael Fried, for whom such exercises smelled too much of theatricality and literalism. Fried's concern is analogous to Wittgenstein's concern with forms of bad surprise. If you start being sort of totally surprising and mesmerizing, that's not necessarily a good thing. I also wouldn't differ with the analysis of Benjamin Buchlow, a more sympathetic critic, who grants conceptual art a very central role, but says that it failed in its effort to reject history and insert art critically into culture. The logic of that art ended for Buchlow in a, a kind of fetishization of the artist and of theatricality itself. Now I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna use images here. The origins of Bachner's work, he was trained as an engineer and he sort of ran into a dead end with abstractionist art. And his early canvases were kind of just plain gray. So thrown back upon himself, he started doodling with magic squares and mathematical objects and this doodling was part of what began to draw him back into thinking that he had something to do in, in, in art. Here is an illustration he made for a, a special edition of Wittgenstein's book, Uncertainty. These are kind of illuminated, he, he thought of them as sort of illuminated manuscripts designed to light up Wittgenstein's text. Um, and the introduction to this edition was made by Arthur Danto, a very interesting critic in his own right. I will not say more about that now because I'm running out of time. Um, so Bachner insists that this is a play on numbers, uncertainty. He says these are not, these are not drawings, but that's to make you ask what a drawing is, of course. Here's more of them. You can spot patterns, maybe. Maybe you're not so sure. Intention is not the point. There's another page. And the quotation he's illustrating on that particular last one is this. Not only rules, but also examples are needed for establishing a practice. Our rules leave loopholes open, and then the practice has to speak for itself. So I hope you see the connection with what I said about Wittgenstein and Dedekind earlier. This is the Krauss Campo at Carnegie Mellon. It's an environmental installation, a later work of Bochner's. And here you see something that is certainly not mathematics, uh, but a kind of external sculpture which has generalized into outward form the history of his effort to regain a sense of what, what he thought he could contribute as an artist. But in closing, I'd like to just mention the work of Jeff Sand, of, of um, sorry, I'd like to mention that the work of Sandback, um, who for me is a much more successful rigorizer and simplifier. Uh, this is a picture of Broadway Boogie Woogie, a work that was exhibited at an exhibition Juliet Kennedy put together at the Mondrian House in the year 2007. These are remarkable works of art, and I think they really do achieve some of the features of simplicity and rigor that I've been emphasizing in traveling through these various examples today. I could read you at the end, I think, just a few words of Sandbach's, but for me these are extremely moving uh, objects. They're sculptures, they're drawings, they're architectural. They don't saturate or theatricalize the space. They're made of yarn, just yarn, sometimes colored, sometimes not. 
The rigor of an installation of one of these works is enormous. They echo the space because they have no center. They have no inside and no outside. They're like architecture. They have to be walked around in to be understood. Whoops, I'm going backwards. Here's another installation of simple red pieces. You see people invited to walk inside the object. I don't consider this dematerialized art. I think this is radically materialized art. This is from an exhibition in Rio de Janeiro. And again, a close-up of the Broadway boogie woogie. I'll just end with a couple of remarks by this artist about his work. My work isn't environmental. It's present in pedestrian space, but not so strong or elaborate that it obscures its own context. It doesn't take over a space, but it rather coexists with it. You can't ever see an interior. Like eating an artichoke, you keep peeling away exteriors until there's nothing left, looking for the essence of something. The interior is something you can only believe in, which holds all the parts together as a whole, you hope. The use of numbers or systems in what I do is very casual and incidental. Sometimes pieces have even numbered sets of measurements. But what I'm doing really doesn't have anything to do with geometry, and it doesn't have anything to do with deductive reasoning. Nevertheless, I see a kind of analogical echo. Nothing's hidden here. There are no secrets. I must say the artwork is unphotographable. You can't really experience such a thing unless you see the art in its place. It's transient. Once these things are taken down, they have to be re-erected in another place. Nevertheless, it allows simplicity to be shown forth. It's not illustrating an idea. It's not didactic. It just is. So that, for me, is simplicity. I think I'll stop there. <laughs>